much welcome to fill our area lakes. Uh, it does cause some devastation for our residents and uh, for our governments down here. Baldwin says today is all about checking out all the problems caused by the flooding. The U.S. military says it will provide some 2,000 anti-tank rockets to Iraq within the next week to help it fight the Islamic State terrorist group. A statement also says the U.S.-led coalition has carried out over 4,100 airstrikes in Iraq and Syria since beginning its campaign in August. Iraq today said it has launched an operation to retake Anbar province from the Islamic State group. And a Shiite militia spokesman said Iraqi forces have stationed themselves around the provincial capital Ramadi from three sides. Unless there's a last-minute compromise in the Senate, the government's power to search the phone records of Americans will expire Sunday night. And President Barack Obama is urging the Senate to renew that authority, saying public safety demands it. I strongly urge uh, the Senate to work through this recess and make sure that they identify uh, a way to get this done. The Republican-controlled House overwhelmingly passed a measure backed by the White House that would end bulk collection of telephone records by the National Security Agency, but preserve its ability to search records held by phone companies on a case-by-case -case basis. Senate Republicans blocked that bill before leaving town for Memorial Day. A resolution passed by the European Parliament could be used as a battering ram to suppress pro-life member states. AFN's Charlie Butts has the story. The Parliament passed a resolution adopting the Terabella Report, which promotes abortion as a fundamental human right, and part and parcel to sexual and reproductive rights. Brian Close of Human Life International tells AFN it's significant, but in another respect, not so much. It's significant because it states that this is a right, but it's also insignificant because the European Parliament that proposed it doesn't have the power to force states to uh, follow its edicts. It's also not likely to pass in the European Union because there are nations that remain steadfastly pro-life. But AFN asked Close if the Terabella report could be used to hammer on pro-life countries to cave in. Oh, sure. It's just another one of those dozens of documents they passed just hitting the drumbeat over and over again. You get two or three of these every year that this is a basic and fundamental human right. And what they're trying to do is get people in these pro-life nations, at least those few European nations that still have pro-life laws, to eventually knuckle under. Which is why those countries remain vigilant, because pro-abortion forces don't intend to let up on the pressure. I'm Charlie Butt. A professor at a public university thinks it's best for his art class students to disrobe before taking their final exam. Some parents and students disagree. Here's AFN's Bob Kellogg. Visual arts professor Ricardo Dominguez at the University of California, San Diego, asks his students to take their final exam in the nude for his performing for the self course. Cultural analyst and writer Lori Higgins. It should be obvious to everyone that the professor is just a creep. He can do this every semester, get college girls, 21-year-old girls, to take off their clothes in class. And he apparently, from one of the girls who took the class, he also disrobes in class. She says Professor Dominguez would never be able to get away with anything close to this in the corporate world. You know, they talk about sexual harassment in corporate America, how little the transgression has to be to be accused of sexual harassment. And here you have a professor asking students, suggesting or urging them to disrobe. Students are not absolutely required to disrobe. But undoubtedly, many feel pressured to do so to ensure they earn a better grade on the final. I'm Bob Kellogg. And that is American Family News on the Hour. I'm Chad Groening. Record budget deficits, bankruptcies galore, and the U.S. dollar is at an all-time low. With today's gloomy economic outlook, safe investments are often hard to find. For over a decade, Melody Cedarstrom at Discount Gold and Silver Trading Company has been helping people secure their future by investing in the precious metals. Melody has the honesty, integrity, and experience that is often lacking in the precious metals business. Let her put it to work for you. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 800-375-4188. That's 800-375-4188. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Evening, everyone. This is Eric Chamish, another Barry on the show tonight. And this is 
Barry has been my friend for a long time. He was actually at my wedding nine years ago. He gave me a fun new dish, which I use to this day, I want you to know. And we had a talk yesterday. I didn't want to spoil tonight, so I didn't take it too far. But um, let's get this out of the way right now. Uh, he asked about Cindy. He's one of the few people who know both Cindy and me and saw us get married. And all I can say is, well, she determines she determines our marriage, and I haven't heard from her in two weeks. And I tried. That's the latest update. What we do with that, we don't know. But, Barry, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. There, I got that over... You know, out of the way, it was inevitable it would come up. So now let's get to your subjects. Look, uh, to my listeners, uh, Barry has got two very separate uh, websites, very separate researches. Uh, the first we'll talk about is at arcode.com, A-R-K-C-O-D-E.com, and we'll, we'll talk... We'll talk Vatican starting out. And the second is at MarsCorrect.com. He lives in Cape Canaveral, so naturally, I guess, what you do there is look up Mars. We'll figure that one out in the next hour. Let's get this hour over with. All right, Barry. I read all your stuff yesterday. I'm educated. Now, your basic claim vis-a-vis -vis Vatican Rome is that Rome is descended from Esau and that the Vatican and modern Rome will recognize a terrorist-driven Vatican state with a Hamas charter to destroy Israel. Esau is very much alive and well in Rome. All right, expand. Okay, Barry. Well, first of all, we have a not very pleasant history and I'm Jewish, so your audience knows. Between uh, Jew uh, the Jewish people, the descendants of uh, Jacob, who is Israel, and Esau, they were, uh, the Bible tells us, fighting in their mother's womb, in Rebecca's womb. And uh, the relationship up was, was not good. You had, uh, uh, you had Jacob grabbing at Esau's heel, supposedly, when, uh, when they were born. Uh, after that, you have a situation where Esau goes out to hunt, for food for uh, you know for his family and he comes back very hungry and uh, he wants a, a little bit of soup that Jacob has and Jacob says sell me your birthright so he so spurns his bright birthright he says what good is it to me you know if I'm gonna starve to death well, so he sells him. his birthright for a, a bowl of soup uh, right, later that, in that the story, makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't apparently didn't respect Isaac too much so uh, later in the story uh, the father is thinking he's likely to die soon, so, um, you know, he wants Esau to hunt for some food for him before he dies so he can taste some of uh, the good stew that, uh, that he makes. And uh, at that time, uh, the mother, uh, Rebecca, does not think that Esau should, should get the father's blessing. Uh, and rather, she, she favors Jacob, so she sends in Jacob to his uh, blind father. Uh, Isaac was blind. And he pretends, to, uh, Jacob pretends to be Esau. He puts on, uh, I think, goat's hair or some kind of animal skin uh, because Esau's hairy, Jacob and is not. And he fooled the father. He didn't he even spot the, the voice. Father. He gets the blessing. It doesn't and then, matter. You hear the voice. Yeah. Yeah, it does, the, the voice is uh, Jacob, he says, but the skin is Esau and the smell was Esau from the field. So then when Esau comes back, he says, uh, hey, here's your stew, Dad. And uh, Esau says, well, wait a minute, who's that I just blessed? And, and uh, it becomes apparent that Jacob stole the birthright, and Esau says, have you new blessing for me? And he says, well, you're basically going to, you know, be, you're going to live by the sword, uh, and you're going to, um, you know, have to serve your brother. If uh, things are really rough, you can throw off his, uh, his, his yoke. But we start out with this kind of a relationship, so it's um, you know a family with some serious problems. And uh, with time, uh, we see that uh, there are a number of battles between the descendants of Jacob and Esau. Uh, in the end, uh, Esau is driven from the area, but he winds up, uh, or his descendants rather, the Edomites, uh, wind up in Rome. And so we have oh, the, the Roman topic. Empire. This is a thousand years before uh, Rome. 
uh, we're talking about Isaac, that would have been like 3,700 years ago. That's right, long before Rome. So Rome comes so, uh, along. Where, uh, where do know, the Edomites become Romans? Uh, at some point, this is the tradition they go out. I'd have to look in the Talmud to see where it is, but everybody's in agreement from the Bible that the descendants of Esau became Rome. And originally, they were given Mount Sair, where, or Sair, which is in the Middle East, kind of southern Israel. And they eventually, after they lose their battles, they make their way up, and supposedly they become Rome. Uh, so Rome, of course, turns around, and, and what do they do? They go back down to uh, Israel, Judea, Samaria, whatever, uh, and, and they conquer the place. And uh, now you have Rome ruling all of Israel, and uh, not very nicely. Uh, so we have some real problems there. And it, this eventually leads to the situation where uh, Israel is destroyed. And Rome drives Israel, uh, drives Judea, uh, all the Jews down there, and drives them into exile for almost 2,000 years. Now, where, do the, where does the word Palestine come from, or Palestinian? All right, okay. now, in order, um, and I'm good to you when I say this in order, uh, my poor listeners aren't aware of you, and actually you're, you're kind of interesting, but we have to put this in order. Now we go backwards all the way to 830 B.C. when there was a Philistine state, and that is the beginning of the name of the current Palestine. Hopping from Rome, it ends up being the current Palestine. 830 B.C. until taken over by the Assyrian Empire two centuries later. There... I did it for you. I, I saved you a lot of trouble. Okay. Um, but basically, the Philistine state, after, you know, they're fighting up through the time of uh, David and a little beyond, they get destroyed. So Philistine becomes an ancient memory. By the time the Roman Empire comes in, Philistine is a, the Philistines are an ancient memory. They're people that originally came from uh, the Greek islands, um, you know, from the Mediterranean Sea, they were not Arabs. They were not uh, descended from Ishmael or anything like that. So the Emperor Hadrian, uh, the Roman I Emperor Hadrian, I believe Goliath Adrian, was one of them. You know, he turns the giant around. giant who fought David. It was Goliath. Okay, that's somebody else. He was he a Philistine. Emperor Hadrian, a Roman emperor, in the year 135 of oh, uh, CE uh -huh. or AD, as your uh, your viewers, most of your viewers would would use it decides that, you know, after there's a revolt uh, by Judea, uh, the revolt was led by Simon Bar Kokhba, uh, and they killed a bunch of uh, Romans in the revolt, but not enough to, to get freedom, that he was going to wipe out Israel completely. He's going to wipe out Judea. And so he renames the province Judea into, the pro into Provincia uh, Syria Palestina. So this is, and the Palestina is named for the Felicians. That was, I guess, the... the uh, Latin version Slap of, uh, of uh, Philistines. So he names it deliberately after an enemy. Now we have the Jewish people in exile for almost 2,000 years as a result of uh, Rome destroying Israel and, and Judea and so forth. And all of a sudden, you know, we have after 1948, uh, we have Israel restored. But Rome's not too thrilled about that. And, you know, on, if you look for a theological cause, the idea that there could be an Israel restored and they didn't accept uh, Jesus is not going to be too popular in the Vatican. But beyond that, there's an ancient hatred that exists. And so now we have gone through a bunch of popes that have, you know, questionable backgrounds. Well, I'm going to add, the current pope, if you don't mind, Barry, you yeah. glossed over that long period in history when what is now... Palestinian territory was a Syrian, ter Syrian territory in short. And that's important because the Arabs view the Palestinians as Syrians. And you, you hopped over that, don't. Well, you know, I've got a lot to talk about here. But yeah, I, I, in my article on our code, which is called Vatican Sides with Israel's Enemies Again Recognized as Palestine, and that you, apparently you're this is what got you to um, to want me to talk. So this is in the article over there. Uh, there came a time when um, Hafez Assad was talking to Yasser Arafat and uh, other Palestinians, 
and he told them, you're, you know, there is no such thing as a Palestinian state. You know, you're, you're Syrians. Uh, other people say, okay, you're Jordanians, uh, but you're, you're Lebanese, but you're, you know, you're not, there is no such thing as a Palestinian state. There have been several Arab leaders that have said that. But uh, it was convenient uh, to, to bring up the idea of a Palestinian state just to, just to, or to hurt Israel. But at any rate, the current pope is the guy, is Pope Francis, who comes along and says, all right, we recognize a Palestinian state. There never was a Palestinian state. There was, as you mentioned, a Philistine state in the year 830 BCE, you know, almost 3,000 years ago, um, but no Palestinian state. And the land that the pope wants to declare is a Palestinian state is Israel proper today. And it's not only Israel proper today. This is very important to understand. If you pick up a Catholic version of the Bible, and you, and you open to the 34th chapter of the Book of Numbers, the borders of Israel are given there. It's called the limits of Hanan or Canaan at the time. And they go through this thing, and they talk about where it is. And it's the Israel of today, pretty much. Uh, there was no Palestinian state mentioned anywhere in the Bible. So well, there were the chunks Pope... of Jordan that were uh, in this state as well. Half of Manasseh got That's some right. land there. Two and a half tribes of Israel were in Jordan. So we have some claim to that also, uh, although we don't right now try to exercise it, and I haven't heard of anybody calling for it. But, uh, you know, they talk about the south side was the beginning of the wilderness of Sin, and, uh, you know, Sinai is, is down that way. Uh, the west side, it was the, great, it was the Great Sea, which was the Mediterranean. The north side is the Most High Mountain. Um, you know, in the Catholic Bible, it says Libanus, but the highest mountain up there uh, is, um, uh, help me out on this, uh, where the ski resort is. Uh, Golan? Golan, in the Golan Heights, the highest mountain over there. Hey, well, that's from Mon. Yeah. No, no, okay. So you have that mountain up there. Okay, one mentioned. you mean? Okay, fine. That's fine. You know, and then you got the, then you says, uh, come eastward, the Sea of uh, the Canara, the, the Sea of Galilee is what it says. That and would then you be down the Jordan, down the Jordan River to the, mo to, to the Salt Sea. So the Salt Sea is uh, the Dead Sea. So this is what it is. You know, and then it mentions no, this in the Catholic well, Bible, you two and a half tribes on the, uh, over the, uh, uh, on the uh, other side of the are Jordan not River. Forever. Are they? What's I mean, that? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm saying that this is what was given to the Jewish people, and it's in the Catholic Bible. So, one of the things that I'm, I'm contending for in this argument, and I know Catholics will, will have a hard time with what I'm saying, but I want to make a distinction here. I think okay. there are hundreds of millions of good Catholics that believe in Catholic theology and that believe in the Catholic religion, and believe in the fundamental principles of Christianity. However, I think that the Vatican is not among them. I think that the Vatican is an atheistic, business-oriented uh, establishment that does not believe in Catholicism or in Jesus or in the New Testament at all. I think oh, its purpose is are. only to make money. And, and, when, and when I say that, I can say that for two reasons. The first of which, more than two reasons really, but the first of which is the fact that if they believed in the Bible, they would use the borders that are in their Bibles and, 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 and accept it, and not try to force down the, uh, the descendants of, uh, of Jacob, Israel, not try to force you know, this land to be given away to a, to a people that are named after an enemy of Israel from 3,000 years ago. But the second reason that I can state personally that I know that they do not believe in Catholic doctrine relates to something that is very personal, and it's a custody battle that I fought for my son. Oh, no, don't jump there yet. I, I'm okay. prepared for that. Uh, right. But you're mixing everybody up enough without doing the personal battle for your son against... Uh, the, uh, the Catholics. Look, in the first place, what you're saying is the Catholics are holding on to very old-time theology, 
and reinventing it and butting in. They're butting in. That's the first thing you're saying. All right. And why are they butting up, uh, butting in? You're saying because they're descended from Esau, which, by the way, is a tough one. Uh, that's for all my listeners, by the way, uh, from whatever point of view, that's a tough one. But more to the point, you give in the book of Numbers that the Catholics do believe that the Jews were given this land and now they're de defying their own Bible, right? Well, you know, they're certainly ignoring what is in their Bible. Thank you. And when you start ignoring what's in your Bible, you're ignoring your religion. I think that's fundamental. I mean, I don't think you can, I don't think that Christians can make a case for, for Jesus if they don't include the, what we call the Tanakh, what they call the Old Testament, because they spent a long time trying to tell us how he was predicted by you know, various prophets, especially Isaiah. So if you take the Old Testament and throw it out, you have no foundation. You have, you know, uh, the New Testament doesn't make any sense because he's going to start, you got Jesus there talking about he's going to start at all the prophets and go through and justify who he is based on what's there. So if you throw out the, the Old Testament, there is no basis for Jesus, none. So to do that, you know, is, well, a, is a horrendous thing. Who's saying they should throw it out? What's that? Who's saying... The, uh, that the Old Testament should be thrown out of the Catholic well, I, I, Bible. First of all, it, I, we won't go into Germany at the moment. They, there was an argument there for that. But the reality is that since the Catholic Church, since this Pope has argued that a Palestinian state is, should be recognized on the state of Israel, where you know the, the land is given to the Jews, he's obviously taking that part of the Bible and he's throwing it out. You can't do it piecemeal. You can't say, okay, I'm going to go back. I'm going to take this half of the Old Testament because it, it suits me. And I'm going to throw out the rest because it doesn't. The moment that you said, no, this is trash, this is not to be believed, this should be, this should be thrown away, you, you talk about credibility or making a case. You've lost everything. They lose all their history if they do that. Well, Every they did that. So what are you saying? They appointed, well, I'm uh, by the way, stop for one second. I wrote an article. It was my reaction to the Vatican reading uh, the president of the Palestinian Authority the same day he appointed two very obscure nothing nuns as saints. They're from the 19th century. All of this, of course, is politically motivated the arabs viewed as a victory because it was pre-israel that these nuns become saints from palestine it in their world this means a lot you mean in their world this leads to what means a lot oh means a lot well first of all you know this is kind of uh, what the vatican's doing is a little bit what they did when they like what they did when when the pope in 1933, signed the Concordat with Adolf Hitler. Uh, at the time, there was concern about the safety of uh, Roman Catholic churches and Roman Catholic people and so forth. So the Vatican felt that if it could enter into a Concordat with Hitler, then, then the Catholics would be safe. So today, in, in the Middle East, you have a situation where there's not many where Catholics that are left. the Jews signed an accord with Hitler called the Transfer Agreement and sold their people to the death camps. What's your point? Yeah. Well, the, the point over here is that what they're doing again is, is similar. I mean, with, if they go back and they reckon, well, here's a, here's a couple of, uh, of great nuns who were saints or whatever, they're just trying to, to do something that, that makes them look like friends to the, uh, to the Palestinians, or not the Palestinians, but to the Arabs in general, not especially the Palestinians, but Muslims, they don't want to be seen as so much of a threat, it won't do them any good. But they're placating over here. They're, they're, they're trying to make concessions. They're trying to show, oh, look, we have great respect for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, Arab Christians and so forth and for the Arab world, so we're having a couple of saints down there. But it's not going to do any good. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas to Rome 
to 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 witness them being indoctrinated. This was done on purpose. Yeah, well, if on this uh, this article that I published, that um, again brought you to to want to do an interview with me. Um, uh, there's a uh, it's and it's from the Torah codes, which we haven't gone into yet. But uh, there, there are a couple. There, the there are several pictures lands. that go along with what's in the Torah code, and one is Yasser Arafat uh, kissing the hand of Pope John Paul II. So then we have well, so Fran, Pope Paris. Francis and Abbas together. Yasser Arafat, of course, so the previous leader of the Palestinians. The story and we have is a not... picture of Pope, Be uh, Pope Benedict over there who wore a Nazi uniform in World War II. He was Hitler Youth and then uh, the uh, Wehrmacht, the German Army. From what I understand, he actually manned an anti aircraft uh, gun back then. The church tried to play that down greatly, but uh, there's a picture of him here wearing the swastika. So we have, in modern times, Why we have a bunch of he folks that are. He was in the Wehrmacht. We're talking about he was he was a Nazi, it not an Francis Nazi. Benedict. Benedict, yeah, he Francis with the Wehrmacht. Francis came in looking very friendly. You know, he had a history of oh, after uh, uh, the Iranians blew up, I think it was the Jewish community uh, community center down there in Argentina. Oh, he showed great sympathy for the Jews at that time, and he's gone to synagogue and done things like that. But now that he's in, uh, in uh, the position of being Pope, uh, and by the way, Pope Benedict, uh, the Nazi, still lives at the Vatican. He sure But now does. he comes up, uh, Pope Francis looks very good, he looks very Christian, like he's going to, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, you know, use all the wealth for my own personal pleasure and so forth. But he turns around and he recognizes the Palestinian state. So in terms of what's important... The fact that he went to synagogue before is not important. The fact that he wants to destroy the nation of Israel, that's important. That's what people need to focus on. The uh, fact yeah, the that rest he volunteered show. after Hitler Youth for the Wehrmacht is slightly important as well. All right, uh, Barry, first of all, we're going to have a very lively discussion. I like this already. Uh, you're doing it a little too black and white, and I see sh awful shades of gray. Uh, and I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, we come back in a few minutes. Um, and by the way, to my listeners, there were only two guests who arrived at my wedding. Barry was one of them. A lovely lady from Southern Florida was the other. They're the only two people who ever uh, saw me and the bride get married in uh, St. Augustine. Uh, just so you know, it, I have a great, great feeling I really relate to this guy. He came all the way to my wedding, all right? So I feel I'm not arguing with him. I'm discussing with him, and I like him a lot. There, I said that. Now, <laughs> Well, the feeling is mutual. As for the, as for the black and white, you know, the shades of gray, they're on my sight. But when you, you bring up a topic, you know, I've got to tell you, you know, what the bottom line is. And so sometimes in, All right, in we'll doing do, that, when we come time, back, the shades of gray, we'll are, do, that, I'll let you bring those out. We're, we're required. Uh, Barry, <laughs> when we come back, hear me out. We'll do your personal case. You sued the Vatican against this policy of baptism in 1984. You'll do that. And then after that, my turn comes. Uh, we're, I make things lively. Tell how you won against the Vatican when we get back and plug your sites. Folks, this is Barry Chamish, and I've got a terrific guest with uh, Barry Roth, and we've got 90 more minutes and plenty more to discuss. I'll see you in three minutes after the Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. 
you will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Hey, everybody, it's very challenging. We've got a great show and lots, lots more to, uh, to talk about. Look, my books are all at www.lulu.com, lulu.com. There's a search box right in my last name, Chamish, C-H-A-M-I-S-H. You'll get to my books. My recent one, The Stinger, Not the Stung, discusses the Vatican at great length. And here's hoping that David Samarin is keeping up my site, www.barrychamish.com. All right, Barry, it's your turn. Plug yourself. Okay. All right. Uh, I said before that there were two reasons that I believe that the Vatican was, was not loyal or faithful to Catholic theology or Christian theology. And it's just a business. Uh, and the first, you know, we discussed in terms of the fact that they totally ignore the borders of Israel you know, that are in their Bible and try to give it to uh, the Palestinians who are really not a people that go back to ancient time. Uh, they are people that really moved in much, much yourself? later, and, uh, you know, Barry, they, there was certainly no pledge Barry, to give them Israel. So the get second this, reason. Oh, Barry, yeah. now let me interrupt you. What you're saying is not plugging. Tell people how they can read you. Give your websites. Oh, okay. Uh, the website, again, is arccode.com. That's A-R-K, not A-R-C, A-R-K, C-O-D-E dot com. And if they want to find what I'm going to tell them about right now, uh, if they're there, uh, they probably want to look for, along the top menu bar uh, for uh, events of 2015. And um, I have to go back and find that just a minute. No, no, don't. Um, 
Don't. Okay, uh, and then it'll be, one of the, it'll be one of the first events of, two, uh, one of the most uh, top events of 2015. Now, um, otherwise, that, they can do a search for Vatican recognizes Palestine, and it, you know, it'll come up that way. But They'll find um, it. Let, let, me, let, me, let me describe the second reason. Uh, they, they, can, they can find this on their own, but um, the second reason, as I said, is personal, and it has to do with a custody battle that I fought for my older son in, uh, in 1984. Now, I have to preface this with the, with the fact that I did not grow up as an Orthodox Jew, as a religious Jew. I grew up as uh, in the conservative movement, and um, you know uh, there was not really an understanding in my family of what Judaism was all about, other than something cultural, kind of a bagels and locks, uh, bagels, locks and cream cheese approach to Judaism, for me. Uh, ethnic rather than theological, movement. is what I'm saying. And so um, I got married at, at uh, one point to a, a woman who was Catholic. And um, she was not a religious Catholic, and I was not a religious Jew. Uh, there was a question of how to raise our son. And she agreed that he could be raised Jewish, but she wasn't thrilled about it. And uh, after I married her, I decided to do some research into my first book, which I'm going to tell you right now I no longer stand by. And that was named The Great Christ Debate. And it was a quest for the theological reconciliation of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It was an in-depth study of where Christians think Jesus was predicted in the Old Testament or Tanakh. And I found that uh, in many cases, if not most, the translations in Jewish Bibles did not read the same as Christian Bibles. And that was significant. So I, I spent about three and a half years looking at the differences and... Um, you know, and publishing this book on it. I think that uh, her mother uh, thought that if I did three and a half years of research or any period of research like that, I would accept Christianity. It didn't happen to work out. Actually, I thought I tried to, to actually tried to look for a middle way between Judaism and Christianity, where maybe he was Jesus was a prophet uh, instead of rejected as he is in Judaism but not God or God, uh, God incarnate or the literal Son of God any more than any other person is. And um, that didn't fly with my mother-in-law. So she basically destroyed the marriage. And when she did, my ex-wife, uh, at the time that my uh, son was about seven years old, took him into a Catholic church and, and had him start a catechism class. At this time... The uh, boy was actually leading services, parts of services in Hebrew in a, in a conservative synagogue. So he had a very strong Jewish identity. What is he today? He's an Orthodox rabbi. Uh, this was he a was really baptized. strong part of what he was Saint about. He was baptized. So his mother, I'm coming to the baptism. When his right. mother took him there, he stood up on the first day and he said, I don't belong here, I'm a Jew. And the nun said, sit down, kids your age, a lot of times they know what they're talking about. So he began to argue chapter and verse, you know, based on what he had heard me talk about from my first book. And so she went down the office and told them that this kid, is, we got a problem here. And so they told the mother that he could only stay there if she would sit in a class with him. So she did. And um, he still tried to argue. And uh, church, she would want him to kneel, and he wouldn't kneel. And so they said, you, you take him away. You know, he's causing problems here. So she took him to another Catholic church. It was Epiphany in Miami. And um, whatever arrangements she made with the priest, the priest baptized my son. And uh, then they held up the certificate and said, ha, 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 you're a Jew now. So... That happened to be a day that I was going to pick him up for custody, I mean, for, for, uh, for, uh, for visitation. My wife and I were separated at that time. We're, I think she right, had we're divorced, we're divorced at that time. She so had I went him. to pick him up. Oh, and wait, 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 don't jump so quick. I asked a logical question, and you're jumping away with your story. She had him. He was in her custody. No, we had joint custody. She had primary residency. I had joint custody. So I had a right to say something. 
and my son was very definitely identified with the Jewish religion, not the Catholic religion. So she mocked him. She said, ha, 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 you're a Catholic now, you're not a Jew. Now, I know Jewish law says the mother determines the religion of the child normally. But in this case, the kid was going in a certain direction, and he finished going that direction by becoming eventually an Orthodox rabbi. So his grandmother, when she heard that, said, what are you doing? He says, you know, he's, he's more Jewish than his father is, you know, and... Uh, so she tried to calm him down, and she said, look, uh, Jesus was Jewish, the disciples were Jewish, we're all Jews, now you are a complete Jew. And that expression, complete Jew, to a Jew, is kind of like, you know, the expression from the Vietnam War, we had to destroy a village in order to save it. Uh, look, if I'm not I went mistaken, to pick him up. now hear me I out. I went to pick him up. And uh, he came barely, running out of his grandmother's house. Uh, Let me just finish this part, then I'll answer your question. And he, he had tears in his eyes and a smile, a smile on his face. He said, Dad, great news. I said, what? He said, Mommy baptized me Catholic, but, but Grandma says it doesn't matter, and I'm a complete Jew right now. When I heard that, I went ballistic. I, at the time, I was the director of uh, the conservative synagogue's uh, Hebrew school. And I got in touch with the Archdiocese of Miami, I explained to them what had happened, you know, and how my son felt. And uh, they said, well, we think the mistake has been made here. So at that time, I said, well, you got to fix it. You know, if you don't fix it, I'm going to sue you for $6 million in memory of the 6 million Jews who died after the Pope signed the Concordat with Hitler in 1933. Again, based on what? What was your suit based on? What was the suit based on? Yes. It was based on a violation of my son's religious rights because he believed in Judaism, not Catholicism. It was based on a violation of my rights as a joint custodial, custodial parent. And it was also based on uh, a symbolic punishment, in, in a sense, for the fact that we had gone through the Inquisition and the, and the, uh, uh, the Crusades and the, the various pogroms and so forth, two, almost 2,000 years of, of, of persecution from this church. Oh, uh, that's not what you wrote here. You wrote because the Vatican signed an agreement with the Nazis and gave away any priests who had even grandparents. I'm coming to that. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm coming to that. Okay. But uh, in terms of, you know, you're getting to how I conducted the, the, the battle in court. So I said to the church, you're going to know this, you're going to do something you've never done in your history before. I wasn't sure then, but now that seems to be the case. And, and they pretty much state as much in the Miami Herald, which is shown in this article. So I said, annul the baptism. So they said, well, we've never done that before, we have to study the matter. So the, the bottom line is that while they were studying the matter over there, um, the story was being covered in the Miami Herald. It actually got four pages of coverage. I have two pages in this article that show uh, the headline is Catholics and All Baptism of Uninformed Jewish Boy. On September 21st, 1984, it was a front-page story, two-page story. And there were two pages before that. Uh, so then I went into court, and the first thing I told my lawyer was, I want to sue the Vatican. And he says, what are you talking about? You can't sue the Vatican. I said, what do you mean I can't sue He was a Jewish lawyer. <laughs> but still... He said, you can't beat the Vatican. So I said, uh, look, I'm, I'll draw up the lawsuit. I'm pretty good at writing. I just need you to, to be by my side when I present this thing and uh, make sure that I don't do anything that's out of line. So then I went to Florida International University, and I found what you're referring to. I found uh, mic microfilm copies of all these newspaper articles from 1933 when this uh, Concordat was signed. And they're all in the book. They're also on my website. But the one I singled out on this article was from December 16th, 1933. And the article is, is it's on page 10 of the New York Times, Parleys on Jews Denied by Vatican. It says, Report of Negotiations with Rights and Status of Those Who Are Catholics is Refuted. So here the article goes on, the Vatican denies that there are any negotiations in progress with German, uh, with the German government concerning the status and treatment of Catholics of Jewish blood. It's pointed out that the Vatican could intervene on behalf of this class of German citizens only if they were being subjected to unfair treatment as a consequence of being Catholics. But since this is not the case, the whole matter is regarded as 
being purely an internal German affair. So in other words, they were only concerned if the priests were bothered, were being bothered by the Nazis because they were Catholics, but because if they had Jewish parents or grandparents, that was, they were not going to get involved in that. So then it said, the only other case it is stated in which the Vatican might consider itself called on to intervene would be if Catholic priests were being prevented from carrying out their duties because of their Jewish descent. This is only, but what follows and is in that two case, such cases what have happens? been brought to the notice of the ecclesiastical authorities, but the Vatican did not consider it advisable to join issue with the German government on the strength of only two such cases and let the matter drop. In other words, so they, they allowed their Jews. priests to be executed simply because they had Jewish parents, or under Nazi law, if you had one Jewish grandparent, even though your parents were good Catholics, even though you were a good Catholic, even though three out of four Jewish, uh, three out of four uh, grandparents were Catholic, if you had a Jew up the family tree as one of them, you died. And so I, and my argument was, how dare you put your hands on my half-Catholic Barry. son and say he's Catholic Barry. if you would not stand up for oh, your own priests? In the Barry, same way. Gotta, when I interrupt you, you've got you to hear me out a little bit, because we're getting good and lost here, all right? All right. Now, let's go, go back to where we were. At the same time this agreement in 1933 was signed, uh, the labor Zionists booted out the religious and the right-wing Zionists and cut a deal with the Nazis selling out their Jews so they could get their damn state. That's what I mean by black and white. You got the Nazis, you found. But where's the mention of how the Jews sold out the Jews? Well, you know, Barry, I've, I've read your stuff before on that. And, and my attitude is, there are a lot of really corrupt politicians in every oh, country, oh, yeah, in, every, ever. in, in every area. There may have been some Jews like that, but I don't some, know that any of them... They ran the Jewish agency. They I, I ran Israel. Know, they founded the place. Yeah, I don't know that any of them understood that six million Jews were going to be slaughtered oh, in yes, exchange, you know, as a result of what they did. They thought there would be I think that million. I That's think that some of like them that. may have felt that... Well, if there's more anti-Semitism, even if, you know, God forbid Jews are being oh, killed, there'll be a place to run away to, which is Israel. And which, you know, and, and they had, I guess, the Jewish population up versus the Arab population. So I, I think, you know, um, I'm not, I don't want to make excuses for what those people did. Yeah. I'm not a Perez fan at all. Frankly, when, they, when, when Rabin was shot, I thought they got the wrong man. <laughs> I, I, would, I really did not like Perez. I really feel that he's been, uh, except for the helping Israel get nuclear weapons. In 1935 says a Shoah, a Holocaust is coming. Possibly two million Jews will survive, but they'll be strong and good for Israel. They knew what was coming. Uh, I'll go on. Away you go, I'll return. Okay, so... Uh you know, so I want to. So you, uh, you wanted me to finish this. What happens with this yes. lawsuit? Now we go back. That, okay, I, know, I got my way, but but and they did annul the baptism, and it hit the headlines of, uh, of most major newspapers in the United States and around the world. And so, what the world reads, I show the Miami Herald article, the two pages that cover the story. And the Catholic Church comes across pretty good in there, you know. And then Monsignor Brian o. Walsh investigated the case for the Archdiocese of Miami. Said there's no record of a case like it coming to my attention, uh, to the attention of the church. And is, uh, he had reason to wonder whether uh, anyone uh, it was ever there was everyone like it any, anywhere else. Uh, they talk about the fact that that my son was was ta was told that if he didn't get baptized, he would go to hell. And uh, they back off from that doctrine in the article. Uh, so it looks like everybody is a kumbaya moment. Everybody's coming together on this. But what you don't see there and what didn't come out is what follows in this article that I wrote, where it, I've got a document there that is a release from liability. You know, okay, what's all that by these presents that I bury what as were you liable? What were you liable to This is a release do? from liability. I know what it means. Why did okay, you sign? Okay, so 
here I'm releasing from liability the Archdiocese of Miami, the Epiphany Catholic Church, the Most Reverend Edward A. McCarthy as Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Miami, his successors in office, a corporation soul, and Reverend David Smith. Now, it says for $10, but there was no $10. All these, that's the standard they put in all these things. The reality is we did a trade. I signed this thing, and in exchange, I got the letter from Archbishop McCarthy. And the letter says, Dear Mr. Roth, this was dated September 13th, 1984. They backdated it a few days. Uh, it has been brought to my attention that, and I'm not going to give you my son's first name. I block it out here for privacy. Uh, Rothman was baptized at Epiphany Church on March 7th, 1984, at the request of his mother. I block out her name. The father, Barry Stephen Rothman, was not consulted prior to the fact and is now objecting. Our investigation reveals that the parents were divorced in June, on June 20th, 1981, and joint custody was awarded. Prior to enduring the marriage, uh, the mother had been a non-practicing Catholic and the father was Jewish. The child was circumcised in accordance with Jewish ritual, and the mother had agreed that he would be raised as a Jew. After the divorce, the father began taking the child regularly to synagogue and Hebrew school. When the mother pre uh, presented the child for baptism, he was seven years of, of age. The priest was not aware that the mother had told the child uh, that the baptism would place a shield over him so that he would not go to hell. Nor was he aware that the child had not been advised that baptism was a sacrament of initiation into the Catholic Church, that he had not been instructed in the truths of the faith, and that prior to the baptism and to this day, the child considered himself to be Jewish. Had Father Smith been aware of the facts, the baptism would have not have been, not have been conducted. Indeed, being aware of the facts and having consulted with experts in the theology and canon law, it is my judgment that, uh, again, his first name is blotted out, Rothman is not a member of the Roman Catholic Church. The baptism was not valid, and the records of the church should be corrected to reflect that fact. Very truly yours, can we use Edward this A. McCarthy, Archbishop of Miami. Barry, can we use this ruling as a precedent to this day? Well, it's certainly can other a precedent. people get out of baptisms using this <laughs> ruling? It's a precedent, but the, but the significance of this is not that everybody can run out and have their baptism annulled. This baptism was annulled under the force of pressure that I brought for a $6 million lawsuit under very specific conditions. And in terms of what others can do, I, I don't know. I think this would be very difficult to have other people follow suit literally in the same way. The significance of all of this, however, is that when you read about you know, the role of baptism you know, in the Catholic religion uh, and you read about their theology, um, there is no way that this should have occurred, uh, you know, typically. Baptism is uh, the first of seven sacred sac sacraments. I'm reading from a Catholic source here, and the way in which a person becomes a member of the Catholic Church. It does five things specifically, it says, forgives all sins that may have been committed prior to a person's baptism, including original sin, mortal sins, and, and venial sins, and it relieves the punishment of those sins. It makes a newly baptized person a new creature. How do you become not a new creature again? It turns the person into a newly adopted son of God and a member of Christ. Uh, baptism incorporates one into the church, which is the body of Christ. If somebody, uh, if it brings someone into the flock of the faithful and brings them to share the royal priesthood of Christ, uh, Catholics, uh, Catholic baptisms give a share in the common priesthood of all believers, and it also brings about the sacramental blood of all, uh, the unity of Christians. I and then they, they go on to talk about that. But one of the things they say here, lastly, but certainly not the least, this was written by the Church, Baptism leaves an indelible spiritual mark or character of belonging to Christ on the soul. Nothing you can do will take away this mark, <clears throat> even if you sin a million times. Those sins may not grant you salvation, but you will always carry the mark of a Christian in your soul, therefore making rebaptism impossible. So if this is their theology, <clears throat> as I write in the article, if this is what they truly believed, and they knew that I had them over a rock and a hard place with respect to their theology, the Catholic Church is a rich institution. If I were the Archbishop of Miami, I would have pretty much done what the priest uh, and, and my ex-wife had said. I would have told Barry Rothman to go to hell. You know, I would have paid um, Barry listen. Rothman $6 million 
you know, because they say, okay, I would have said our religion, our theology is more important to us than money. During the, uh, the Inquisition, we were faced with a situation like that. When they came to us and said, accept Catholicism, accept Christ or be burned at the stake. We said, okay, go ahead and burn us. And they did. All right, let's use this moment to push. Let's plug your book, A Matter of Spiritual Custody, okay. which Before tells you about your... Okay, you plug anything, I, Barry, listen carefully. I gave you a copy, a souvenir copy. I, I think you might be able to find one out there online. No, Somebody let my readers book. find I do not sell the book. Nobody does. Uh, in terms of regular bookstores, I, it's not carried on Amazon.com, other than if somebody owns an old copy and they want to sell it. So you I'm not plugging the book. your book is told in your... All right. Your full the book story is, for is free, not told on an the... updated version on my site. Good. So if they want to read Spiritual Custody, they go to rcode.com, and they look at the top menu bar, and they'll find where they can go and read it for free. I'm not getting a penny for it. Wonderful. Thank goodness. Like pulling teeth to get... All right. That's how you get to a matter of spiritual custody. You go to arccode.com right. and you'll see it. Boy, getting that. All right. Now let's get back. Uh, once again, this man really did win a victory against the Vatican. And I know what they're up to, and it breaks my heart. You know the Pope is so friendly. Last night I'm watching TV main headline the pope hasn't watched tv in 25 years that was a headline they make him to be so friendly and nice he doesn't watch tv it doesn't matter they are pushing this friendly pope out there and it's just what can you say any bit of reality you can see past this Go well, ahead. in terms of how people appear in public, I, I, I'm reminded of John Edwards, and you may recall how friendly he looked, how nice he looked, and then when he was in private with his mistress on the airplane and he didn't realize it was being recorded, we heard the truth about, you know, how, what would people really think if they, if they knew the truth and you know, what suckers there are and so forth out there. I don't you know, know who John I, Edwards you know, was. The Pope, the Pope can say whatever he wants to. The previous Pope, the Nazi, is still living in the Vatican, the Vatican helped Jewish, I mean, helped Nazi war criminals escape on what was called the Rat Lines uh, to South America and also to the United States. Um, the Vatican was, was, was certainly no oh, threat. No, no, uh, no friend, rather, to the Jewish people during World War II. Barry, I'm not saying there weren't priests we, who helped, but there were, but Barry, the Vatican was not. You, Go ahead. You've got to slow down. We have to take a break. There's no choice. we got <laughs> commercials. Uh, we Go have a it. very good conversation. I have got lots of reactions in the next hour. Uh, I read you well today, so I'm educated. Folks, this is Barry Chamish. Oh, we'll be back in seven minutes with Barry Rothman. Uh, see you then. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.
I pledge allegiance to the King of kings and to his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One holy nation and our heavenly Father, grace, mercy, justice for all. American Family News, I'm Chris Woodward. The president's executive order that would protect millions of illegal immigrants from being deported is still blocked. Jerry Bodlander reports. In a two-to-one ruling, a federal appeals court in New Orleans has refused to